Okay, hello and welcome to episode 12 of Talking Shop with Tony Abbey. My name is Matt Lezinski and I wear a few different hats here at Newtons. I'll be your host today. Uh, this week, Tony is asking a question. Can designers really take advantage of FDA strength and stiffness predictions? This is a topic which is starting to touch on other areas of discussion like democratization, so I think uh, it will be quite lively, uh, if you will. Uh, per the usual, we'll start uh, with a 30-minute presentation. Following that, we'll move into a Q&A so Tony can address your questions and comments. So with that, I would like to turn it over to Tony Abbey to help us answer the question, can designers really take advantage of FDA strength and stiffness predictions? Tony? Thank you very much, Matt. It's slightly tongue-in-cheek because basically I am an analyst. I, I try very hard to become a designer, but I'm not a very good designer. So it's kind of skewed from that perspective. But I really am um, very keen to um, think about the way that designers can get involved in FEA. I do a lot of uh, training classes, introduction to training classes specifically for designers, really try and understand what, what, you know, what's required, what their motivations are, what the issues and problems are. So that's, that's kind of where the background I'm coming from. I would stress these, these thoughts and comments are completely my own. Um, they no, don't represent um, NAFEMs and also I try and keep a very neutral stance. I try and kind of monitor the complete field of all the, the software out there. So um, if you feel, if you're a software vendor, I'm not picking on you. I'm just kind of <laughs> making comments in passing as it were. Um, so um, in the old days, uh, there was this, this brick wall, we used to call it the wall, and it split the drawing office and the stress office. And it meant that really the data interchange, the communication between these two um, areas was very, uh, very sparse. Basically, we've got concept design coming in from somewhere. This is kind of harking back to my early days in the mid-70s in an aircraft uh, office up at um, Wharton, up in Lancashire, what was British Aircraft Corporation, now all part of BA Systems. So somebody would come up with concept design, maybe a future project office, uh, some project office, and then basically that would be worked up. And we would get drawings kind of thrown over the wall, and they were paper drawings in that case, and then basically, doing a uh, stress analysis on them. Not so much FEA in the early days, uh, predominantly hand calculations and checking. And the objective was to produce a stress, uh, check stress for the, the type record. If things didn't look good, um, under strength, under size, whatever it might be, we threw it back over, we go fix it up and so on. So often the main communication was between the chief designer and the chief stressman. It wasn't so much at the, the kind of engineer level. Now, in many cases, this has kind of disappeared. The wall has kind of gone away. But I do find from time to time there's kind of evidence of it still around. So that, that's our big danger is lack of communication. And I guess the thesis would be if we can actually get um, more integration, I've actually got designers involved in the uh, doing analysis as part of their or simulation as part of their, their process, that's going to really help. The trend these days is much more to multi-purpose engineers. We don't see this um, this kind of effect quite so much. But that that was kind of where I came from, where the issues were. And we would have a small pocket of FE analysts here over in the stress office. You gentlemen are all a lot older than me by the look of it. I think it's a Victorian office, but you kind of get the idea. So in the old days, the workflow looked something like this. Um, we'd actually be looking at physical drawings on the drawing board. Um, engineering data, product knowledge and experience, that's absolutely essential. And the pre-processing, I, I call it that, but it's a bit tongue in cheek, it was basically overlaying transparency on top of the, the drawing board and then creating the mesh. And then from that mesh, um, allowed and bad conditions would all be input text file. And we use card, card images. So basically everything would get translated. We'd write out a pro forma, get translated, get punched up. We'd find, feed that in our case into the mighty IBM through this input text file, um, and then the solver would output our output, obviously, and it would be fanfold paper. So very, very tough um, to actually get some idea of the stresses and deflections. You needed colored pencils. You were sketching over the top of that uh, overlay I talked about, and then a report being produced. So it was actually quite, quite tough in those days. So I don't have a lot of sympathy sometimes with people who say, well, this, this is um, pre or post processor is tough to work with. Well go back to the bad old days. Um, the, the computing costs then were extraordinarily high. We've got 1976. I worked out it's about $5 million in today's money, and the computing power is less than my iPhone. I can remember when the company bought it in, they nearly kind of broke them. The software, um, somebody, a smart young lady loading the software here, 
I couldn't get a hard value for the uh, typical um, software that we would use in 1976. Just um, anecdotal evidence said that the pre-sales and post-sales engineers all travel business class, so that gives some idea of the actual. They were pretty rich companies because if you're charging five million dollars for a computer, then you know you, as a percentage of that, you can see the price is going to be pretty high. Um, the algorithms were very inefficient compared to modern codes, so what we see today is a tremendous speed up in the performance of the computers, but also the efficiency of the codes. And the prices obviously dropped. So a laptop here, which you can run a lot of stuff, we're talking about maybe um, maybe $1,500 market. And again, software prices, um, maybe 15 to 20 uh, K dollars, maybe even less than that uh, per annum will, will get you a, a pretty good solution. So things have, have become cheaper and um, more readily accessible, which is one of the key things here. But again, in the old days, the bad news was this is a very simple sketch of a model. It's just rods and the loading and battery conditions. We actually had to translate that into a definition. So over on the right here, this is the gobbledygook. This is the, um, the kind of arcane language that we had to get familiar with. So we had to set this up. We've got the, the, um, the nodes or grids. We've got the bulk data, loads, boundary conditions. This is what <clears throat> the solver needs to see. It doesn't, um, we can't sort of explain it to the solver any other way. We need this input text file format. And I, I mention that because all in all, if we think of that expert skill set, the FEA expert, what did the FEA expert need to know? Well, a lot of it was stuff like the arcane syntax and language in that raw data. And then when things go wrong, we get a core dump to be able to interpret that error message, which would be very, very cryptic. And then we had odd things like, oh, we switch this system cell on, then it does this, or we do that. Job control language is like the wrapper that goes around the, the card inputs, essentially, to tell the computer what to do. Um, estimating runtime and many re memory requirements and so on. So as you can see, this is a skill set needed, but there's not very much engineering in it so far. And there's absolutely nothing the designer needs to know. So this is the, the kind of the, it, this is sometimes what made the experts, and that we talk about an ivory tower and so on, losing touch of reality. You can't really blame us because all this stuff is, again, completely abstract. Now we get more to the engineering uh, sort of side of the skill set. Uh, we've got to read drawings. Um, and in that way, these are the 2D uh, drawings, paper drawings. That was a skill which, in many ways, it's a shame that that's gone. Spatial awareness is very, very important. We're always working 3D. Our, our models are 3D, and we've just got to always be thinking about that kind of approach as opposed to uh, kind of a three-view, 2D type of approach coming from the, the drawing office, perhaps. Idealization models are, and methods are absolutely key. So here we've got a very early approach with shell and rod elements. Things have get more sophisticated since then, but it's basically how do I take the real structure and turn it into something which can be represented in on the, on the analysis. Knowing the limitations of the analysis, things that can go wrong, um, we've talked about some of those on the, the um, presentation so far. Loads and boundary conditions set up, particularly boundary conditions, are always tough. They remain tough. Results interpretation, there you have to have a, a set of colored pencils to be able to figure out what's going on. So we're getting to the engineering. This little uh, diagram here just reminds me, we always used to like fresh engineers coming in from, uh, from say, university. We'd say, would you like to do FE analysis? And they'd say, well, can we? That's really cool because that was the red hot technology then. Can we get involved with that? You say, sure, yeah, here we go. And then after like uh, three months, say, would you like to do another one? And, and no, <laughs> because of all the, uh, the, the hassles and issues associated with that. Um, so today, we, we have a much uh, more rounded and slicker process, much more automated. And the flow is going to be, instead of paper drawings, we've got CAD in some way, obviously, a binary data file representing a very, very nice visualization now, a 3D spatial representation of the structure. Um, we take that geometry, we mesh it, uh, and then the pre-processing really is a pre-processor. And we produce, but still the same input text file, and 95% of solvers are still going to use the same syntax. It will have expanded, it got more sophisticated, but it's still the same syntax into the solver outcome results. Now, fortunately, I'm not having to overlay over the drawings anymore. I've got uh, nice binary files and very sophisticated post-processing, and then I, I produce my report. And there tend to be um, two, two flavors to this kind of route. Um, the CAD embedded, this would all be one 
uh, one environment. So let's say SolidWorks, uh, Autodesk, um, PTC, uh, and so on. And basically, it would be one environment where the um, the pre-processing, the post-processing, if you like, has been bolted into a very familiar kind of interface. So that's what I'm going to refer to as CAD embedded. The traditional pre- and post-processor, you, you're bringing in your geometry externally. And funnily enough, sometimes uh, in the early days, as this evolved, there'd actually be three separate companies, one producing the pre-processor, one producing the post-processor, and one producing the solver. These have tended to merge together now with acquisitions and so on. So you get this as being an environment, say, from ANSYS, from Abacus, from, NAS, uh, from, from MSC, whoever it might be, as a complete kind of description. So the more traditional pre and post, and then the later CAD embedded. And I'll be talking about that as, as a kind of difference. And I'm going to talk about that as CAD-centric, the CAD embedded, and then kind of FEA-centric as the, the more traditional kind of, uh, F, um, kind of pre and post environment. So this is all we could handle in 1977. It's kind of like our standard model, 200 elements, uh, no stress convergence, probably not using stresses, probably actually um, using forces and then back calculating in the stress office. Our job was very often to hand off the loads, uh, the load paths to detailed stressmen. That was, that was the role. In 2016, I did a, a presentation to show how computing power has evolved. For about the same cost in 2016, you could do this. So now we have a very sophisticated solid mesh model, about uh, 0.4 million elements, good stress convergence. Obviously, you have to make sure you get it right in terms of load and boundary conditions and so on, but you can see the progress that we're, that we're making there. So the modern FEA expert skill set is still spatial awareness is very, very important. Idealization methods still, analysis limitations, and so on, all the same thing, uh, still very, very vital. But now the tendency is to get more into advanced methods. So as an analyst, now I'm pretty well required to have a good handle on at least, say, two or three of these. Uh, so nonlinear dynamics uh, from basic all the way perhaps to, say, something like random response, dig and fracture optimization, thermal, depending on what, what your particular skill subset is, um, not just doing static analysis, not just doing normal mode. So the question now is, how much does the designer want to take on board of all this? This is all open to the designer now. How much does he want to take on board or she wants to take on board? And indeed, how much should they take on board, which is perhaps another interesting question. So the idea now is that this flow that I talked about isn't just happening once. It's happening kind of sequentially. And the key thing is like the spine down in here is our product is maturing different evolutions of the of the product, of the design, uh, of the, the representation with CAD, and then basically looking to improve this as we go through. We're trying to push, um, some people say, like a leftwards push. We're trying to get analysis further upstream, up the uh, design chain as possible, so it really can impact the product. Um, if the FE analysis is occurring after the design is free as a present and complete, we're kind of back to that old kind of sign off check stress type approach. And then sometimes FEA is thought of as, as a roadblock. But what I want to talk about is the designer not just being involved in, say, completing each stage of this. But what I want to talk about is more subtly is the designer get involved in that process and actually within, say, one design, working up that process quite a few times. So that, I think, is, is a slightly different approach. Uh, not doing a, like a mini stress check each evolution and design, but getting into more intimately into that um, that design workup. I'll talk more about that as, as kind of as I go through. I want to. I was thought, how can I best describe uh, you know how it all goes together? And so I, I came up with a project example I did a few years back. It's electronic equipment housing. Um, it, the main chassis here supports printed circuit boards, heavier trays with electromagnetic equipment, and so on. And the environment was very, very harsh. Um, it's basically a vibration environment, and everything was in the kit, in there, everything including the kitchen sink. So like normal modes analysis, frequency response, shock spectra, random response. These were specifications we had to meet, but we're working this up from almost like a clean sheet. So for, for me, the to scoping the dynamic response of design to make sure the structure is in the right ballpark to meet these loading environments was very important. For example, if I got resident or the resident frequencies came through and they were um, n not in the right place, 
they could in fact impact very directly the frequency response, response, shock spectra random response. So we had to shuffle and get those frequencies right to be able to get this, this structure to work. So basically that, well, that was the idea. Now the design variations were kind of thick and fast. Basically electronic equipment distribution throughout the rack was changing. And even the dimensions of the chassis were changing. So it was uh, quite a lot going on. The initial approach was to import the CAD geometry and mesh with solid elements, somewhat similar to a kind of CAD-centric type approach. Um, I had, there was some idealization going on there. So the small electronic equipment components were smeared over the PCBs and the rack in a typical kind of way. Heavier electronic equipment, hey, we've got spiders again. Here, there's, uh, I'm looking at Spider-Man now. Um, I won't comment on that, Matt. Um, but basically, um, the, the, the type of spider depend on the stiffness and lump masses were being used. So there's quite a lot of idealization required. We bonded things together, or I bonded things together using linear contact. I was aware that that tends to over stiffen bolted and particularly slotted connection regions. So that was a kind of a big caution in there. Now I ended up with about 10 million, 10 million degrees of freedom. Um, normal modes was fairly quick, but it required 250 modes, which is a lot across the range of interest because there's so much going on in this idealization. Um, or in the solid model, let's say. Um, dynamic analysis response, frequency response, and so on, was very slow with a huge amount of data. And the problem was I couldn't respond to the design, um, design changes fast enough. So I actually had to revise the analysis approach because um, the design started to change almost every day. So to be responsive enough, I had to change to my idealization to the more FEA-centric approach of 2D and 1D, so shell meshing and beam meshing and so on. So the basic idea was to take the um, CAD geometry, mid-surface that, which I had to do in the, the preprocessor, and then set up the walls of the tray to have a very uh, regular mesh. Everything is 2D or 1D. I could pattern the mesh and control the mesh. So as I moved the height of the trays up and down, these slots, uh, edge slots and so on, it was I could control it kind of parametrically. Um, mass and CG with the spiders could be uh, controlled very, very rapidly. Just changing the component positions around became very fast. I could have used bonded contact on the edges. Um, at that time, I couldn't bond an edge to a surface. Now, now you can. So uh, with hindsight now, that would be a better way of doing it, make it even faster. But this is the route I was forced down to, just to be responsive enough. Now, the initial analysis did show some resident frequencies strayed into areas, we, and I had to shift them around. So it's PCBs uh, vibrating, stiffer trays with heavier components were an issue as well. So working with the designers, it was on the phone a lot saying, no, this is no good. We've got to shift this thing around. And basically coming up with stiffening schemes, uh, mass re redistribution schemes, um, working with the designers to say what, what we can do. Once I got a stage where it was working, it was very tempting to, I'm an analyst, I want to say, well, is that right? Is that accurate enough? So the temptation was to improve the mesh, kind of do a convergent study. But I had to sit on my hands and say no, because the design was not frozen. Um, and if I start to focus on that, then it's just a waste of time because design moves along. So there were several significant configuration changes due to electronic performance equipment rather than structural response. And that meant a lot of um, rapid dynamic response analysis required, very fast turnaround. So in the end, it was a compromise between the structural response, the electronic uh, design response, if you like, or efficiency. I think the electronics guys kind of had the, the big stick, if you like, but so we were kind of trailing. But it was a requirement, uh, and it became like a bit of a trade-off between the two disciplines. And so a lot of work going in there. So from this project, the, the conclusions I came to in terms of the, all this set up and so on is it what did I need? I needed a knowledge of spiders, the mass, non-structural bass idealizations and so on. I was forced into this shell and beam idealization. Um, manipulation of the CAD geometry, I had to do that. Med surfacing was essential, but I, I didn't do it in the CAD geometry. I, I did it in the preprocessor and I'll talk about that in a second. Understanding of shell and beam idealization, why are we doing this, the limitations and so on. This um, parametric meshing uh, the implications of bonding, and also key data output. I had to have one of my data drivers. Um, I can't afford to dump uh, a huge amounts of data and then rummage through it. I'd have to uh, quickly look at, say, key accelerations, uh, key positions, 
uh, key output quantities, which I would be then matching across these designs. Um, again, um, efficient post-processing of that key data was essential. Now, could I have done a more efficient job? Yes, with hindsight, I could sit back and say, well, maybe I did it that way or that way, but you're kind of under the gun. A um, little bit like I put Matt under the gun this morning with these, uh, these on-the-spot poles that we were, that were talking about. And so basically, um, yes, I could have done. But the big question, though, is could the designer, could a designer achieve this design trade-off? And that would have been great because then the designer would have been coming up with these changes on the structural side, feeding back within that same group very tightly, maybe the same guy doing or gal doing, doing both of those. So that would have been, again, faster, and more efficiency. So that that's probably would have been a right candidate for that, that type of thing. I think at this point, uh, Matt, we, we thought about uh, putting a, a poll in. Do you want to take that away? Sure. Thanks, Tony. Okay, so we're going to release a poll to you right now. Uh, the question is, what is your focus for mesh prep? Is it FDA-centric, CAD-centric, or something else? So we'll have a couple of minutes here when you can uh, give you time to respond, and it looks like everyone's actively working on that now. So uh, Tony, we will probably let it run for a couple of minutes and check back in and see what the results look like. Okay, sounds good. So um, so I'd be very interested to see what your breakdown would be to see whether this audience is more the CAS centric or, or FEA centric. As I said, I confess, I'm more of an FEA centric guy. So FEA centric perspective, being an analyst, I said I struggle with CAD tools, I try very hard. I take my hat off to designers and people who can really drive these systems. And I think the systems themselves are really fantastic. Um, but I took an FEA-centric approach to electronic equipment. I used um, this traditional FEA processor. I used a lot of idealization control to support rapid changes. The primary objective of an FEA traditional processor is to produce an FEA mesh. Um, it's not interested in geometry. Geometry is just a means to an end. We've got to get the mesh in there into that input uh, analysis file, and then the results can be processed, uh, and then the analysis can be run. So the challenges with this type of tool for the design community are that um, we're thinking in terms of the abstraction of the FEA entities and the meshing strategy, um, accepting avoiding the limitations of the geometry manipulation tools in this type of uh, product, and then there's a pretty steep learning curve for this type of tool. So I'm gonna look at each of these points in turn. How's the poll doing there, Matt? Yeah, we uh, we have about uh, maybe about one third of our audience that I think they're just so focused on hanging on to every word that they've not responded to the poll yet. <laughs> two, thirds, two thirds have responded, and uh, so far it looks like FEA centric is dominant with about uh, growing about fifty percent of the audience, uh, followed by okay. about twenty percent with CAD centric. Okay, that's very interesting. I'd certainly be in the Q and A. Very interested to hear from the CAD, the CAD centric side. You know, I've worked with a lot of designers in my in my kind of teaching to try and understand and get behind what they they they're working with. I've taught a couple of classes where I've actually used the CAD embedded products, kind of you like live in, in the teaching classes, and they were very very interesting. So I kind of had a dabble, but I'm not, if you like, I'm not a professional, I'm not an expert in that area. So. Um, but some of the points I mentioned, abstraction of FE entities and meshing strategies, there's, there's actually no requirement to model everything using 3D elements. So thin shell regions like the PCBs that we had there, very, very efficiently uh, modeled with 2D shell elements uh, meshed on surfaces. Um, mesh mid-surfacing is, is very good in the traditional pre-processes. I'm always very impressed with that. Some fix up to do and so on, but it's generally pretty good. And the CAD embedded tools, I, I found it's just very poorly supported, which always kind of amazes me. So that means there's a kind of a head off there. If you're going to use CAD embedded with, um, uh, you need to be doing shell meshing uh, and beam meshing. That's that's a problem. The shell meshing tools within the traditional approaches have a good range of what's about defeaturing and manipulation. Um, and so the mesh is treated almost as like that is the virtual geometry. We can adapt it as required. So things such as if I wanted to change the thickness of a, of a plate or a sheet, for example, one dialog box entry, and, and then the mesh is, is, is changed. There's no change in topology. It's just, just a data point. Um, I can change the design locations by moving the mesh around and rebonding parametric uh, methods that I talked about uh, in there. Um, so um, 
with beam elements, it's kind of even worse. Beam elements are, are kind of very much our kind of friend. Uh, we, we like to frame like type of structures, uh, oil rig jackets, things like that. You can set them up very fast and efficiently using these kind of tools. Cross-sectional areas, I can either define independently or I can actually pull them in from imported CAD. But in CAD embedded tools, one, the idealization is very tough. I've tried it really seriously hard in a couple of these tools, and uh, um, it, it is not easy to do. Um, geometry manipulation in the traditional preprocessor, um, this is sometimes where I've taught um, traditional preprocessors in my past, where you have a bunch of designers come in, CAD guys, uh, I almost think I'm almost it's like almost like a mutiny, you know. Expect us to use that type of technique, but originally, ironically, um, the FEA workflow in in the preprocessor started with direct meshing. If you go back to sort of like the uh, the 70s and even the early 80s, there's no geometry to hang on to. So by definition, everything is is direct meshing. Later on, these same preprocessors actually evolved 3D geometry techniques to provide a, a framework to hang the mesh on not bringing in geometry, but actually creating them themselves. And ironically, these uh, solid geometry engines, the Boolean tools and so on, are actually way ahead of the CAD modeling tools of the day. I'm talking about the very late 70s, well, probably early 80s to, to mid 80s. But unfortunately, although they, were, they had the lead, and I can remember presenting to um, project office, my FEA model was the only incarnation of a 3D representation, there was nothing coming out of the drawing office because they didn't have any 3D tools at that point. Um, it kind of stayed stuck. So these inbuilt geometry tools never matured. And compared to the modern CAD engines and CAD tools, uh, they're, they're pretty, um, pretty clunky. They're unattractive to designers. Um, but the traditional processes, preprocessors live in this meshing, mesh manipulation world. So um, they're, they're more important to actually manipulate the mesh than the geometry. So as a kind of a band-aid to get around, what we often do is to say, uh, I want to work with the CAD geometry. So um, either I bribe somebody or I get good at CAD geometry and produce an FEA-friendly version of the CAD so I can dodge or, or avoid this inbuilt geometry manipulation. And that's a very standard kind of approach. The steep learning curve associated with these tools is, is, a, is a major obstacle to casual or part-time user. Uh, every preprocessor has a unique workflow, and some are quite idiosyncratic. Um, and it's funny, you almost get like a badge of honor. I spent 20 years plus working with this preprocessor. I've earned my right, you know, and we kind of live together in this, um, again, like an expert in that particular workflow in many ways. But now there's a lot of work being done to make these user, user interfaces much more attractive. That's great news for me because now I've got a more attractive, easier to use user interface, but it's also perhaps um, mapping over into the designer environment who who doesn't want to go up this steep learning curve. But for the designer, perhaps it's still outside that very comfortable for me in a CAD environment. So maybe, you know, how good does it have to get before a, a designer is going to step outside that environment? That's, I think, a very interesting question. So to kind of bridge that gap, I call this going further with FEA-centric. We're still thinking about something FEA uh, uh, people are going to be using. But now um, there's some very interesting new developments. And one of them is like meshless methods. If we avoid the need for meshing, that really uh, helps in many ways. Now, there's, there's kind of swings and roundabouts here. But uh, that's, that's a, a very a powerful kind of approach, which is, which is coming through. One approach here would be to do away with the concept of discrete elements. So the domain is being essentially uh, discretized. Um, I won't get into the theory behind that. But it avoids the need for specific shell or beam elements, which is very powerful. The program kind of recognizes shell-like areas or beam-like areas and actually uh, modifies the approach so we don't need to do that level of idealization, which is a huge benefit. Also, um, large assembly components can be assembled and connected. Uh, analysis is fast. Stress accuracy is not a given. We've got to check the stress accuracy. Um, another approach approximates the geometry with like a bounding mesh. And that is amazing uh, speed up in real time analysis. So with also using graphical processing units, you can actually start to move the design around and see the stresses change. You've got a file system almost before your very eyes. Now stress accuracy there is, is an issue. It's limited to around 20%. That's not going to be used for sign off analysis for sure. 
but its role is to kind of work up and, and say, well, how is how are we doing with this conceptual design? Uh, for slightly older approaches, well, a much older approach is the adaptive order meshing approach, p element type approach, again, that plays a role there. I wrote an article in Digital Engineering back in January 2019. Um, I, you might want to check out that. I go into a little bit more detail of this approach here. So that's one of the things which is pushing forward to get more sophistication in the FEA-centric approach. The other one is what I call virtual geometry methods. These techniques include saying, well, the parent card geometry, rather than trying to work with it, let's just basically kind of reinvent it or redefine it within that preprocessor. So the manipulation tools, the geometry control is written in a kind of a more of a native language. Um, and that, again, becomes a very powerful kind of approach. Or maybe some of them actually replace the parent card geometry with mesh and mesh control techniques. So that, again, directly going to mesh, things such as mesh morphing, meshing on an existing mesh, mesh parameterization. And the mesh is more direct to a definition of the geometry of that analysis model. And there can be all sorts of mixes of these. So I haven't really kind of tried to allocate these to different software packages because they all have interesting variations and mix buried in there. Synchronizing FEA and CAD models, a lot of people are doing this. So basically, um, the FEA model is linked to the external CAD geometry. Driving the CAD geometry, you update that, and then the mesh loads and boundary conditions on the FEA side are uh, automatically updated. If it's bidirectional, which is tougher, then mesh changes can be reflected back into the CAD model. So again, a lot of, lot of movement, a lot of interesting development in these kind of areas. So it's basically this uh, going further is trying to say, let's get towards something which is slicker, faster, and, and perhaps more attractive uh, to designers, which is the particular thesis I'm talking about here. And obviously, it's, it's going to be more attractive to me as well. So watching this area with, with kind of avid interest. Now, the CAD-centric approach is essentially the CAD-embedded type of solution. Um, I, I started off with my, um, my component here on my assembly. It was very much a CAD-centric approach. That, that's take the, the geometry, let's mesh it with solids. So we could say that would be a typical CAD-centric approach. Uh, sorry, CAD-centric, uh, CAD CAD-embedded. Um, and the attraction for the designer, if the CAD-embedded approach, is that consistent user interface. And that's very, very significant. That's huge. It tends to bind designers to that solution. Um, other advantages, there's a direct link between geometry and mesh. If this one is a bit of a, a double-edged sword, idealization is at a minimized, minimum level. You don't necessarily have to do much. But that then actually might cause you some limitations. So from my experience with other projects, teaching, working with people using these, these kind of products, the main limitations would be I, I, it's difficult to create 2D shell mesh, as I mentioned that before. The PCB and the racks here were screaming out for that. That means, because it's so difficult to do that, and it really is, then uh, long run times, a large amount of data is required for each design iteration, which is where I made that transition. Geometry changes as I change the parent geometry. My loads and boundary conditions are probably going to be updated. Um, my idealization methods, such as the smearing, the spiders, they probably have to be updated. And if I'm using mesh controls, which I'll talk about in the next slide, they have to be updated. So it might seem attractive. It's just like get new geometry and remesh it. It's actually more subtle than that. Um, mesh controls is tempting to use automatic global mesh size and other global mesh controls. But that gets very expensive. And it's very cost effective to overlay local mesh controls on that to try and say, We've got an element, element budget. Let's put the elements where they count. So there we would use local meshing controls and so local controls and so on. If they're going to be disrupted every time we change that uh, design um, variation, then that's not so attractive. Um, and further, some CAD embedded solutions, depending on your license, they may limit the, the scope of the mesh control. So you might not be able to do that anyway. So again, there's going to be implications if you want to move around quickly. Now, this is something I, I'm, I'm very keen on, evolving the FEA with the design, the CAD-centric approach. And I think, to my mind, this is one of the most powerful applications of structural simulation within CAD. If we have a feature history tree in the CAD environment, I can start off with a beam here, the one at the bottom. This is CAD geometry. And I work it up, and I uh, add the lugs. I uh, add the, the, the bolting points 
horizontal load input, and I add the end lugs as well. So I start from this, I work it up, and then does that. Now what tends to happen is you work it up, get to the end point, and then do the analysis within the CAD embedded environment. What I'm saying is, why not roll backwards and forwards? I want to look maybe at just sizing, not of this in great detail. I want to look at the sizing of the general I-beam cut across section there. So if I roll the history uh, feature tree back, do analysis at this point, then I can do initial sizing on that beam. Now to do that, what I've got to do is to know something about the FEA entities which are available to me. So here's my famous spider elements. I've taken the beam, no sophistication at each end yet, zoomed in there. And why not do this? Initial sizing check on the beam. Say, OK, and now I've got that sized. Uh, that's done. Now roll forward again with those updates, those implementations, uh, and back to now. Let's get some detail at the ends there. So it's within one design um, kind of session almost, going up and down that feature tree, rather than just saying, OK, that's my variation. Now let's do the stress check on that, still within a design environment. And I started to try and teach this, try and introduce people to this idea. And uh, it's kind of interesting. It's still a work in progress. But I, I really like this kind of this idea in here. Um, for example, with the center section, I, I can design these bolt holes. Um, but then I've got this, this bending load. So if I put the stress the bolt holes here, stress concentration hits me, is that by the limits. Uh, when I was working this up, I put the bolt holes here and the extreme flanges there. And I should have known better because then I've got stress concentration three times the extreme fiber stress. Man, that really hammers that structure. That taught me an obvious lesson. So rolling back up and down the feature tree to say, I didn't like that. Let's look at this. I can use patterning, hold patterning, and so on to say, let's change the, the idea there um, at this point. And, and I don't maybe not having got the end, end lugs yet. I come to that later. Let's focus on this. So kind of segregating, uh, almost kind of like focus on this area, this area, it lends itself to very, very, I think, a very um, uh, kind of um, a very interesting way of approaching it, rather than just doing the analysis all at the end when the, the design is kind of committed. So one of the big issues that people talk about is, OK, we're doing FE analysis. We've got to avoid errors, maintain accuracy. A lot of the talks I've done on the on this series um, are associated are with that. So basically, um, uh, we want to, to make sure that we get things right. The concern for many is that the FEA used by a designer uh, with little or no knowledge is going to be very bad news. Um, so uh, if we assume that uh, advanced analysis is not being used, um, well, before we do that, Matt, we had another poll, which I, I completely skipped through. Do you want to mention the poll at this point? <laughs> you didn't wave your hands around to say. Well, I, I didn't want to interrupt because I, I know we're making some progress there. But uh, we'll be very quick with it, um, just to quickly share the results from the last poll. Uh, so hopefully everyone can see that. Uh, FEA centric was definitely the, uh, the majority there. Um, so basically the same numbers we looked at last time. But let's look at the second poll. And uh, that one will ask the question, do you feel that CAD embedded tools sufficiently support shell and beam meshing? So we'll uh, roll that uh, poll out right now. And then maybe we can come back to it uh, right before Q&A. Uh, Tony, if that makes sense. But, yeah, that would yeah. be great. Uh, I, I see in the chat there's some comment from, I think, David Byrne is saying that, um, uh, no, sorry, some, I, I don't know who's, who's saying that. Um, beam meshing is no problem in, in, in PTC Creo. Um, so again, um, I'm perhaps a little bit um, focused. I, I've worked heavily with two of the CAN embedded products. Maybe there's some pros and cons in there. I don't want to get into this software versus that software. But again, um, uh, it's an interesting kind of discussion. These are the weaknesses that I saw, and I really, really tried hard to work with a lot of designers to try and say, well, how can we make this better? Use their skills to say, I want to achieve, say, mid-surfacing. I want to achieve uh, line elements. Um, how can we do that? And you can do it, but the workflow is, is very contorted, which is, which is the point I was making there. So we'll come back to the, the results of the poll there. In the meantime, I'll, I'll carry on with this assumption about what, what should the designer be getting involved with this. Um, if we assume that we're not doing advanced analysis, so we're not going to be doing fatigue, random response, nonlinear, we're looking for this initial ballpark assessment on strength, stiffness, normal modes. 
And it's not going to be a safety or mission critical structure. If it is, it's going to be checked off by an analyst. And we know the design has got engineering judgment. You know, you've been working up the, these designs. You looked at operational usage, uh, similar designs, and so on. So you've got a lot of a dreadful American phrase, but you've got a lot of skin in the game. You, you know, you're not coming fresh to this. Then, then why not have the designer involved if these are some of our kind of, um, you know, the environment in which it's happening in? Because basically, um, it's the chicken egg situation. Is the design strong enough? Uh, I don't know. I haven't got a design. What does the design look like? I don't know. I haven't got any stresses to size it with. So we've got to start somewhere. And why not start with the designer to, to kind of get us from this clean sheet to something up there? To say I'm not a designer and take my hat off to people that can actually come up with that early concept design from scratch. Again, it's going to be a lot of previous experience, a lot of design knowledge kind of feeding into that. So let's add to that and add this ability to look at simulation and particularly the way that um, I've, I've talked about before. So um, given a design, uh, the big question is who's going to carry out the analysis? If we say it can be the designer, then um, I guess the key question then is it more efficient to do that within the CAD environment or are the more traditional analysis focused, uh, analysis centric environments good enough so that the uh, designer feels comfortable enough to kind of perhaps migrate or, or uh, uh, move between these different environments? I think the answer depends very much on the nature of the design and the analysis process. And I have literally talked to hundreds of clients about these issues. Um, FEA-centric or CAD-centric or some of the newer techniques coming through, it tends to be that if their skill set is FEA-centric or CAD-centric, that's what they lump for. Uh, there's an old, not a lot of crossover I see uh, in there. If, you, if you're focused like me, you, you're kind of a CAD-centric, sorry, FEA-centric guy, you tend to live with the limitations of the FEA-centric. If you're a CAD-centric guy, you tend to work with the limitations of that. You, you make it work. Um, now, there are enormous variations in these workflows. Uh, talking to many people, I'm amazed at the, the routes people take through. These are tools, how we use these tools. Everybody has a different kind of approach. There's a lot of new technologies emerging or maturing. I've kind of hinted at some of those. Those are very exciting. As an analyst, I'm very interested to see how they can help me and basically understand stressing. After 40 years, I still don't understand stresses, understand load paths. I want to learn more about them. And I think these tools might well enable me to do that. But I think overall, in, in the context of the discussion we're having today, I think the key for the designer is I want to see the designer immersed in the analysis and design using that CAD feature tree or similar, using the FEA um, simulation techniques, idealization techniques we've got within a design evolution, not at the end of the design, but within that, within that going up and down that feature tree. That's essentially the, the point I would make there. How are we doing with that poll, Matt? There we go. Uh, actually, it's just about to close right now, so we'll go ahead and share the results. But uh, what you can probably see is almost a near perfect bell curve. <laughs> so uh, you can see the majority happen to fall in sort of this neutral, or uh, perhaps the agree, disagree, but uh, only about 5% on the tail ends for strongly agree and strongly disagree. So. Okay. <laughs> and for those that strongly disagree, that's great. Please, um, um, if I don't get a chance to answer Q&A um, uh, in the Q&A, please uh, feel free to send me um, uh, email or contact me directly because it's a, an area I'm very kind of passionate about trying to get uh, these tools, particularly the, the CAD-centric tools, to perhaps ways we can work um, better with them. Um, so I think at that point, Matt, um, I'm pretty well... Uh, uh, I'll, I'll wrap up for the moment, and I'll hand over to you to um, uh, to do to do the marketing part. Well, oh, thank you. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, well, obviously, thank you for this this great presentation, Tony. Uh, just to let everyone know, the next session will take place on August 21st, and we'll talk about FPA models. Are they under constrained or over constrained? Uh, thank you, Matt, for uh, for that, and uh, let's dive into the Q and A. Um, Steve Fisher, Steve, you always um, give me great quotes here. Steve says, tell me you're not the guy who uh, crossed the runway at BAE with a bundle of punch cards and you get the wind blow the punch cards everywhere. Actually, that did happen to me. It was my uh, second week and I was carrying a, a card deck across to the computer center for the chief engineer. Um, I tripped and fell and all the cards ended up in a puddle 
and so they went upside down all the way around and unfortunately the, the water stick things together so it was unusable I thought that was the end of my career luckily there was a fellow analyst or walking in who um, was delighted about this he took hold of the car deck and he wanted the pleasure of actually showing this mess to the chief uh, chief uh, structural analyst and so um, he, he kind of took the heat and he enjoyed doing that so uh, that's kind of a little spooky there, Steve. Yes, <laughs> almost not quite. Um, Tony just Tony Fell makes a comment. Pigs and Pathak. Yes, absolutely. Going back, uh, Pathak was a much loved old uh, UK uh, uh, solution, and uh, um, basically um, it, no geometry in sight. You created your own. Pathak had uh, they call it pigs, dogs, all sorts of different uh, animal names for their different modules, which was always rather um, uh, <laughs> rather curious, but again, back in the day before we had geometry, uh, Ivy mentions he, he answered others because he has a mix uh, solutions in there. Um, uh, Ivy makes a comment again. I, um, this is Ivy saying that CAD, FEA embedded CAD tools are too primitive and limited, too difficult to validate and support. Um, Says so trust the tool dot. Um, that's kind of an extreme view. <laughs> Thank you, <laughs> Ivor, um, uh, for that. Um, and I think you kind of carry on, continue on. Um, so we have to put the, in his team, put the FEA specialists in the middle of designers to have full interaction and teach the designers to provide CAD compatible, compatible FEA for easy um, rollback, as you state, and have simple methods to simplify details in CAD. So that's producing the CAD-friendly variants um, and allowing designers, I guess, to work up some, some levels. Um, I think, um, Ivor, you're in a very uh, kind of high-tech company, um, so that, that might be the way of going. Um, I've seen many people work that way. All sorts of interesting variations where um, one group working with offshore uh, equipment, very complex geometry, they actually seconded uh, a couple of designers over who could work with the CAD tools very quickly and very efficiently. And their role was to actually turn the geometry into FEA friendly so it was ready to mesh. And they actually started to do analysis as well. So it was an interesting kind of transition between, um, if you like, the CAD centric and FEA centric. They're the guys acting as, as like the, the middleman. Um, there's lots of things we could talk about here, but certainly um, how to prepare and prep uh, CAD geometry for analysis is a key thing there. Ivor makes the point, we, he does heavy multi-physics and, and knowing Ivor a little bit, uh, I knew that was the background. So special FEA tools um, allowing the mixture not only a structural but also thermal, uh, CFD, ACDC, optics and or even chemistry. So yeah, that we wouldn't expect the designers to play a, a key role in the simulation tool there but they're playing that that supporting role in there. Sanjay Kumar says, how the designer should use FEA results for better product design. It's only stress, strain values are sufficient for product design if it's subjected to various loading conditions. Um, yeah, and again, part of that uh, job would be to say, what, what are the, um, what is the definition of a, a, pro uh, a product which is okay? If we're working up that product, from design point of view, we could look at, say, something like von Mises stress, and let's say keep below 20% 20, 20 below yield might be a criteria, where, again, we're not trying to size it. We're not trying to get to the ultimate level. It's just getting that ballpark uh, um, design right. So if we, again, that kind of 20% uh, inaccuracy that we accept, it's just getting something down on the sheet, if you like, something out there, something which is going to work. Uh, we're making the decision, um, there's just not sufficient space here, the load's too great, I need to change the design concept. It's that kind of thing I'm talking about. And then maybe as the designer gets more experienced and more skilled, maybe he starts to polish the design so that handover to the stress office or to the analyst uh, is, is a, um, it's almost ready to run, you know, it's just a final check. So different variations on there. But I think every designer could certainly learn and could certainly benefit from it, are we in the right ballpark? Are things about right? We could look at a strain-based approach and say, um, just roughly, is this strain level okay? I'm not expecting 
a detail assessment, a load pass, um, and so on. That's down to the analyst always, but just again helping this um, helping this uh, this design flow, this design process. And also, um, again, for me, understanding uh, load paths, stresses, if I can actually change the design and see the influence of those stress changes, that to me is very, very valuable in there. Yunxin says, I do structural thermal and magnetic coupled models. Again, these have to be FEA-centric. So again, we, what we're seeing is that um, if you've got a very specific, uh, very um, going up that, that level of FEA requirement, uh, as uh, Youngson is saying there, that's not going to be something that designers can necessarily get get involved with. Um, Jake has an interesting question. How would you convince people who are too busy in the current process to step back and see the benefits of this integration? That's a very good point. Um, you know, I, I've made an effort to look at CAD-centric. I could have just stayed with FEA-centric, but I guess because of my job and my uh, responsibility for teaching and trying to understand a, a broader range of approaches. I spent the time doing that, trying to convince people um, of to switch or to take a broader view is, is difficult. It's really, um, I guess it's got to be a compelling reason to change. You've got to look at this software and suddenly say, you know what, I could really use that. And I, not just, I, I, okay, I can make a change to that, but I want to make a change for that. So there's this compelling reason for ease of use, uh, speed of use, uh, ease of getting access to the results and so on. That's what's going to drive people. And so basically the it, it, the tools are going to prove themselves essentially. So I think that's a very good question, Jake. The answer is people are going to be very reluctant to change unless there's this compelling pull really to move over there. Uh, Steve makes the comment, uh, sometimes the engineer is only uh, looking at part of the system. So sometimes the issue is with the definition of the boundary conditions. Otherwise, they'll be measuring the, the rig, not the design. Again, indeed, all sorts of um, issues there associated with the idealization, the more subtle kind of idealization. Um, I know the company you, you come from, Steve, and I've worked quite closely with that company from time to time. Interesting idea there, which I didn't get a chance to mention, was actually um, templating and uh, producing templates probably produced by experts to say if I'm going to do this type of um, analyze this type of design or that type of design it's kind of putting in a bit of a ring fence around what the, the designer can do in terms of the analysis um, the trouble is uh, I think one of the issues there was it takes a long time to parameterize to to set up that kind of ring fence so that let's say you've got for example like a con rod so you can have all sorts of variations of the con rod but it's been um, the designer can now work within that, but it's like a controlled environment. The trouble is if you step outside that design arena and do something different, you've got to do that parameterization all over again. So there's some interesting um, uh, uh, approaches there. Um, uh, James mentioned, makes a point, I find that many other designers now are also very keen to do some of their own FEA and that it's about making certain everyone knows their limitations during the design FEA process. Are there good ways to have both sides know where that point is? Um, a very, very important question. I, I do a lot of um, work with conjunction with, with NAFAMS, working with one particular client, where um, the idea is that the designers will actually um, basically be assessed on their knowledge, and I go in and kind of teach that required knowledge then they're assessed, and then they can make the jump to do um, to to use FEA in their uh, design work. So that's one approach. I, I get a bit of a plug there for NAFEMS and the uh, the um, um, the professional engineering approach. Um, it, it, there's no easy answer there. That's one way. Um, I think it's education, it's training. Um, I don't want to train a designer uh, into the intricacies of shape functions and higher order, what an element does, what's a serendipity element, and all that kind of stuff. What I want to do is just practical um, hints and tips, things that can go wrong. I, I've uh, alluded in the past to, I do a course which is FEA for um, engineers and managers, sorry, for, for managers, um, who those guys don't have any technical background whatsoever, but I can teach them how to be dangerous in terms of things to look out for, that things that can go wrong. 
So it's that kind of thing that we're kind of trying to do with the designers to say, yeah, it, it can be slick and quick to do, but you know things can go badly wrong. This is the subset of key things we want need to look at in terms of checking things that can go wrong and so on. So I think it's that that kind of intensive the the issues, the problems, and so on that there would be um, uh, would be the case there. In terms of uh, analysts understanding what designers do. I would love to have um, more slicker and more um, easier to use CAD tools. I think it's a two-way street. I'd love to be able to dive in and make changes, see my stress implications come through a lot. I can learn an awful lot, as I said, about design changes, sorry, about stressing and stress analysis. So I see the influences of design changes. When I saw this instant um, uh, analysis, as I would changed the design kind of real time, first off, I thought that was a bit of a gimmick. And then I suddenly thought, I can actually explore load paths. I can understand what's happening. I can teach myself a lot more about um, engineering and stress distribution load paths. After 40 years, I can learn from this. So it's a two-way street. I think um, the, the designers can learn more about the limitations of, uh, of FEA. Uh, the FEA experts can learn more about their job and the, in, in the implications of design as they get more immersed as well. So I think it's a very interesting kind of meeting of mines. Youngson asked a question, do I think all engineers will use FEA in the future? Um, yeah, it, it probably is heading that way. There are going to be cases where, like I was saying, you've got a very, very specialist area. Um, we can't expect those people to be using like electromagnetic design, uh, multi-physics, and so on. But there's going to be some role uh, that um, can, people can pay there. One company, for example, the end product is, is too the, the physics is too sophisticated. I struggle to understand the physics involved there. But as part of that process, you've got to handle and lift and transport this equipment around. That's a rather more straightforward kind of packaging, cradling, and so on, which is great application for, for this kind of approach, you know, the CAD embedded type approach. Um, Oliver makes the point we found that load capacity increased significantly when moving from a CAD embedded solver to a well-known standalone um, when running nonlinear structural simulations to failure. Yeah, again, that's, that's again associated with the CAD embedded products. What is their strength? It, it is getting involved in this design stage. They do have um, advanced simulation techniques available, but do they necessarily have the depth there? So I didn't really cover that, but I, I completely understand what you're saying there, Oliver. If you've got a more dedicated FEA solver, where it's been built up over many years to answer these very specific questions, then that again is the um, the way to go there. Um, Iva uh, makes a comment, a positive point to CAD FEA tools. They're good for the structure designers to test out redesigns, uh, pre-designs and concepts, but raw before they add bolts and all fillets again. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I think that's that sizing, that workup before you put the detail in. I talked about going up and down the feature tree. I think that's this exciting area in there. Um, again, good discussions required between the designs and FEA specialists. My first uh, shot was showing that wall there. And I think the emphasis, you're absolutely right to re-emphasize this either. It's the tools are going to make that um, designers or analysts you know, maybe transferring or, or kind of um, merging the um, the skill sets from a tool basis, but again, there's that um, that dialogue, that discourse, that interaction between the designers and the FEA, taking that wall down. That's happening more and more all the time. So I think if you have these kind of tools, you may have a project team which has analysts and designers. They're kind of cross uh, cross matching. Maybe you know you're helping the designers are helping the analysts understand design implications because they're showing them what happens live kind of thing as they maybe use the CAD embedded products. And then maybe the analysts are showing the designers some of the implications of the more high-end um, analysis and there's discussion and dialogue, then that's great. I've not even touched on test and I've not even touched on manufacturing. These are all disciplines which all, again, need to kind of meet in, in the middle here with this kind of common approach. So I think with that, <laughs> we'll we finish on that point. I don't have all the answers. I've just put some thoughts out there. Again, I really, uh, really uh, look forward to any other 
kind of feedback and comments that come through. We try and make these a little bit provocative. This perhaps was the most um, potentially the most provocative little little talk we've had there. So at that point, I'll shut up and I'll hand over to to Matt, who's sitting there, so that Matt can uh, can wrap up and do the marketing again for us. Thanks, Tony. <laughs> And uh, excuse me, thanks everyone for joining us today. Uh, as usual, we'll get the recordings posted uh, usually within a few days. Um, it'll be some part next week. Uh, just a reminder, we will hold the next session on August 21st, and you can see the topic there, and we'll send out uh, announcements about that. And Tony, one other thing too I was going to mention is that there were some great comments in chat uh, from, from David and Christopher and some others. So what I'll do is I will take those comments and send them to you uh, following today's session. But yeah, thank you, and thanks everyone else for joining. Thanks, Matt, and thanks, everybody. Uh, really enjoyed that. I look forward to this, this further feedback. So thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.